Thank you so much for joining our 20 minute talk show today. I'm very grateful that you're here. Um, it's a big honor. I know you're very busy and I know that you're flying to the US tomorrow. And I'm just touched that you would give your time on such a short notice and join me today. So Ms. Lakshmi, I have heard so much about you. And I'm gonna tell you, I am your biggest fan. I love all your videos. I love how you share stories. I love your passion around it. And I know that the Ink Talk has received so many millions of peoples uh, following you, um, has affected a great deal of change and brought change here to India and made differences in people's lives. And so I want to know about your journey. How did you decide, what was the moment that you decided to bring Ted and Ink here? You no, know, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, what keeps me going is people like you, meeting interesting people and connecting them to others. So thanks for inviting me. And uh, um, so I just want to say that I always feel all journeys don't start with a moment. They start with a lot of things that has happened in the background. And in one moment, you make a decision. So for me, I've been going to TED since 93, and uh, uh, you know, Rick, who started uh, TED, is a good friend of mine, and Chris, who runs it. They're all family for me. So I knew that TED was going to become big, because when internet came, when TED had this amazing content that was going online, and I knew TED.com was going to become big, and there was hardly any Indian talks on TED.com at that time. So I felt that if I brought TED to India, we can have a lot of people get to know about TED as well as get a lot of Indian voices onto TED.com. So that's what led my decision. So I went to Chris and I said, why don't we host TED in India? Uh, and then it so happens Chris has a personal connection to India because uh, he grew up in India, Pakistan, and he's uh, really? very close to yeah, India. So he also said, oh, let's do it. And that's about it. It was just that one moment I went up and asked him, uh, and he said yes. And that's taught me a lot about, we hesitate a lot to ask things, because we feel, oh, where is Ted? Where am I? How can I ask? And all these things. All it took is go up and ask, and, you know, and then it was a lot of work afterwards. But it was in that moment I just decided we should bring it here. That's amazing that you brought Ted here. Was it challenging to um, execute TED here? It was, uh, it was quite challenging and we took a lot of time. It took almost a year and a half from the time we said we would do it to the time we actually did. We spent a lot of time. And I think it's very important when you're doing something for the first time to do it really well, to take all the time it takes to line things up really well, um, connect with the right people, get the right team involved. So the TED team from US worked very closely with my team here, and we all worked with the nice. Infosys team who gave us the venue. So it's like everybody came together and worked together as one team. And uh, so it was very challenging getting there, but once you know, the camera action it opened, it was absolutely beautiful. I wish I could have been there for the very first one, looking back, you know. I, to be you were probably a kid. <laughs> well, probably, <laughs> right. It, maybe. <laughs> yeah. At that time, maybe. Right. So, I want to know, with your journey with the Inc. talk shows, you have thousands of different speakers who have come through. Who is the one that is the biggest inspiration from all of the peoples that you have met? Um, you know, it's like how I always get asked this question and I say it's like, who's your favorite child? You know, it's impossible to say it. But I'll tell you one thing though. Every year we have celebrity speakers, be it James Cameron or Matt Groening who started Simpsons or Wendy Calhoun. And there's like so many celebrities who come by. But we have a program called Ink Fellows where every year we pick 20 amazing people from completely different disciplines. And it could be someone like uh, Vicky Roy, who's a photographer, to Arunima Sinha, first female amputee to climb Mount Hood, to Nirman, who's working on artificial intelligence, to Gadadhar, who's creating materials that are going to go on the Mars exploration, to Manvendra, who's building beautiful townships, to Devi, who's doing agriculture. It does, it's like a 
whole gamut of people. So every year we pick 20 people. And to me, it's amazing to see the transformation from the time we choose them to the time they give their talk, the transformation they go through. Um, you know, they come in, um, you know, sort of like, I don't know what I'm doing, or uh, they're already doing amazing things. But seeing their stories evolve, for example, this year we had someone called Ankit Agarwal who takes flower waste and creates incense out of it and also vegan leather out of it. So, you know, his story completely changed from the time we started to the time he gave the talk. And to me, every year to see this transformation, it's like having a child. I feel such joy and such excitement. Um, and I can imagine, like you're saying, with the evolution and that nine months and, you know, be, where they go from being selected and being on the stage and how they grow in their own self-awareness. What is your vision for the next five years with Ink Talk? You know, it's, I realize when I look back over the last 10 years, this is our 10th year, um, it's never been my journey. It's been a collection of people. Even if you look at the fellows program per se, you know, there is uh, Lalitesh, there is Raghava, there is Shweta who runs the program or, you know, there is like so many people who come together to make everything happen. I realized over time, Inc. was not at all about the conference or about the talks or about the views we get. It's really about the tribe we have created. And everyone looks forward to getting together. Everyone, you know, all our fellows say, we meet each other just to hang out with each other. We just don't even need anybody to come and talk to us. We just want to be with each other. Because most of the time, when you talk about a crazy idea, people say, but it'll never work. So no, I won't support you. But the tribe we create is about and I understand what you're doing. Yes, what can we do about it? So the vision is to transform to, we've already, we're already there, but to accelerate our own journey to accelerate game changes through the ink tribe we are creating. That is amazing. I'm looking forward to see the next part of the journey with ink and the tribe. Uh, I understand that you spent a lot of time in Portland, yes, Oregon, in the U.S. Beautiful state. Yes, yes. And I had read um, about Shoe Dog. Have you read the book Shoe Dog? It's uh, the founder of Nike. Had oh written yeah, the yeah, book. right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, Phil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, from Portland yes. themselves, yes. and yes. they had talked about Mount Hood. Yes. And so then, you know, I connected Mount Hood to you. And based on my research about you, ma'am, mm -hmm. I heard that your house at that time had a view of Mount Hood. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. how did you feel? I mean, you woke up every day and you were able to look up yeah. Mount Hood. Yeah. Were you inspired by the view, by the mountain itself? I was, I mean, actually to this day, I call Portland my home. And I think that's the place I really grew up even though Hyderabad is where I grew up, but I became an adult in Portland, uh, Oregon, and I loved Portland State. It's one of the best universities I could have gone to. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. And yes, I woke up uh, to Mount Hood every morning, and I woke up one day and I said, I'll climb Mount Hood. I had no idea what it took to climb really? a mountain like that. So I said, oh, let me climb Mount Hood. And then I found out from some people how do you do it? And they said, oh, there is this club called Mazamas. You go with them, you train with them every weekend. I was terrible. I mean, I was not at all good, uh, you know, in, in uh, my ability to run or walk, let alone climb. And every weekend we would go on these hikes and I would be the last one, you know. And actually the first time we went on the expedition uh, to Mount Hood in the middle of the night, I couldn't make it. I had to come back halfway. And it got me so upset that I decided I was going to come back and do it. And I asked the um, uh, people there in that inn, how do you train for really climbing a mountain? And they said, actually, it's your lung power that's needed. You need to run every day, actually. I just kept walking every day, going on hikes over the weekend. But they said, if you can run three kilometers, you can climb Mount Hood. 
So that was such an eye opener for me is that to do one thing, you may have to train in something totally different. So I started running. Uh, I couldn't run, uh, you know, more than 10 meters to start with. <laughs> but slowly I got it. And a month later, I went back. I climbed it. I was one of the first, uh, you know, few people to climb it in my group. Not uh, ever, you know, it's like it's still slow. But it was like a huge accomplishment for me to fail and go back again and do it. But that got me started on running. Then I started running marathons and you know all kinds of things. But that's what Portland does to you. It's, a, it's such an outdoorsy place that if you don't walk, run, climb, do all these things, you feel like an invalid. So it was fantastic. That's absolutely amazing that you accomplished that. So do you still do outdoor activities here in Bangalore? I do. I mean, I don't think I can run a marathon anymore, but uh, I get up in the morning and I walk. It's just like my routine. I just get up, drink water, and I walk. No matter where I am, I always go for a walk in the morning. And I try to run a little bit, but uh, walking is my, it's my, uh, my time, my personal time. And I require my quiet time in a day. So that's my quiet time. So. Whichever city I am in, wherever I am, I just get up in the morning and start walking. Nice. That's wonderful. If you were to write a book about your life's journey, what title would you give it? I don't know if it's about my journey or not, but the book I've always wanted to write is called A World Without Heroes. We all uh, live too much in hero worship. We make people, we are looking for somebody to give us the answers, etc. But the real inspiration is all around us. So to me, it's, it's really a, a world where there's no one hero, but so many people I met uh, that really changed my life. So that's the one I'm thinking right now to write is called A World Without Heroes. Wow, great. I love that title. Yeah. I hope you write a book soon. Yes. I would absolutely support the book. I would buy a stack. I would read it as many times as I could. I will definitely write to you and say buy 100 books. So, <laughs> Surely. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. Oh, why not 100 books? I would want to convince the world to buy more than just yes. 100 books. <laughs> yeah. So, ma'am, I'd like to know what are your top three values in life? Ah, uh, this is a tough question because your values keep changing depending on where you are in life. But I'll tell you um, the three lessons that I've learned in my life that I always carry with me. Um, one is a quote I've read in some friend's house. It says, if you're not being rejected at least three times every day, you're not trying hard enough. So I really love that quote because it lets you handle rejection in a very positive way. Um, and the second thing is, um, uh, you know, and this is something very pertaining to women in general and especially Indian women, I think. We learn some, from the time we are kids that if someone gives you a compliment, you say that, no, no, I didn't do it and, you know, whatever, Joe helped me or John helped me or whatever you know you s you give the credit to everybody else but you feel very awkward to say yes i did it so when i was at intel my boss told me that i make it very difficult for her to argue to get me a promotion because every time she tells somebody look what a great job lakshmi did they would say no lakshmi said she didn't do it she said joe did it or john did it so she said you have to learn to take ownership of what you have done so when someone gives you a compliment, you just say thank you and shut up. So that was the biggest lesson for me that when someone says something nice to you, you have to learn how to accept it and stay with it as opposed to feeling awkward about it and guilty about it, etc. And the third thing is also what my dad taught me is that when you're doing something different, everybody won't like you and if you want to be a good girl everybody will love you but then you have to do whatever everybody wants you to do but if you want to do something different this adulation won't be there for you but 
the people who love you will be there for you for the rest of your life they are not there to see you in a position or a shape or a form they are there because they love who you are so you have to always make a decision do i want to be loved by everybody or do i want to be loved by people who care about what i care about and when you're clear about that you have no problems because then you can face a lot of people not liking what you do a lot of people being upset at you a lot of people saying you're mad why are you doing this this is crazy this is not right this is wrong whatever it is so i think these are the three things that are very important for me in my life always to remember if you re get rejected it's okay if you do something great just stand in it and thank everybody because it's just not you it's the whole team and at the same time take the ownership of that and finally it's that don't try to be liked by everybody it's just impossible right i agree with those that's in you explain it in such a clear way i understand that so you grew up here in india yes what was your dream as a child what did you see yourself or aspire to be i don't know i think my dreams kept changing when i was a kid my cousin padma and i used to always play i was dr lakshmi she was dr padma and we would be you know like uh, treating imaginary patients and all that stuff so because my whole family was doctor so i didn't know anything else and then in my i had no i never thought about what would i be uh, you know whatever in front of me i did it well and when i didn't do it well i thought what else can i do so i never ever planned my journeys the only thing i thought uh, when i was in portland state i did my mba with a minor in theater arts so i thought i'll make enough money and move to la and become an actress that's what i was going to do but then i fell in love with technology i fell in love with intel and it was such a heady times i was learning so much uh, that i never ever thought of what will i become i always looked at what's in front of me and i said can i have fun with it so i never had huge ambitions for myself that i should be the ceo of a billion dollar company or i should be this or i should be that i never had those ambitions in fact if i had more than five people working for me i would tell my boss give me some other job because i don't want to manage too many people i always loved doing new things um you know going somewhere where nobody believed and being a bit of a maverick in that area and um, get everybody to believe in what you're doing so i always uh, you know only looked at what's in front of me not where i wanted to go and actually i say that uh, when you go for a job interview that was the toughest question to answer because they would ask what do you see yourself in 5 years um, and i would say breathing you know that's about it i think i'll be alive in 5 years otherwise it wouldn't matter but beyond that no idea okay beautiful <laughs> beautiful that's a yeah. beautiful sentence yeah. i i want to thank you so much for joining our talk show sure i've really enjoyed the conversation learning so much about your your healing your your strength your um your values and your journey i'm absolutely touched i just want to say that i know you're talking about strength etc um i just want to at the end say that i don't feel strong at all i always feel i'm always just overcoming my weaknesses and uh, and i think it's more important to overcome your weaknesses than to be strong i don't want everybody to think i'm somehow strong i'm perfect i somehow have figured it all out i haven't figured it all out at all and uh, to me what's exciting is conversations like this so for example i've never had a three way conversation like this before and i've never done right. an interview like this before so seriously this is fantastic Yeah. Well, welcome to my world. Here's a <laughs> yes. little glimpse of my world. Yes, absolutely. So I think it's really wonderful. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.